Um, so thank you very much for joining us, everybody. If this is the first time that you've uh, listened to an iPhotography podcast, my name's Stephen. I'm one of the tutors here at iPhotography. And today I am joined by the rest of the gang, effectively, as well, minus uh, Rebecca. Um, so I'll just go around a little hello and you can kind of uh, just give us a, a little hello and a wee wave as well, because we are also recording this. So as much as you'll be able to find it as a podcast, you should be able to see it as a video on YouTube. So with us today, we've also got Nick. Hello. And we've got Rachel. Hello. And we've got Emily. Hey, hey, hey. So thank you very much for joining us, as we say. So today we're going to have a little chat about common photography mistakes that we find a, a lot of new photographers kind of tend to make when kind of coming into this, this hobby or this industry. Now, not all of them will apply. You may find you've never made any of these mistakes before. You may find you've made completely different ones and you're learning from them. So these are just ones that we've picked up kind of in our, in our experience as photographers and tutors um, to give, give you maybe a little bit of forewarning, really. So ultimately, Ultimately, you know, there's everybody can make mistakes. It's it's no matter how experienced we are, and uh, you know, we can all mess up. That's just kind of completely human aspect. So this is really just like a bit of a a warning, a bit of a guide as to kind of maybe what to expect from things that you will do, and then it's completely natural. And also maybe to kind of how to guard against that in the future. So uh, we've got a few different points. I think we kind of little chatter through as well. But I'm sure the rest of my team here they'll uh, kind of throw up a few different things we want to talk about. But the first one that um, I written down when when I was kind of making notes here was about people that only shoot in JPEG. And now obviously this is specific when you've actually got a camera that shoots raw as well, but there seems to be that kind of worry that people don't like shooting in raw, but I don't know if, if any of you guys kind of ever experienced that yourselves or, or seen that happen. Um, I tend to shoot, um, I use the state where it shoots in raw and JPEG at the same time. And I just keep it all set at that at the highest quality. Um, obviously, you can save less uh, images on your camera because it takes up a lot more um, memory, doesn't it? Uh, but I, I just prefer working that way. So I've always got the option because sometimes if you if you just want something quick and somebody needs to look at it quickly, you can quickly just send them off a JPEG, mm -hmm. and you don't have to convert it. So I, I always shoot in both. Is anybody else like that? Yeah, I I'm I'm raw. For, for life now but <laughs> way back in um my earlier sort of travel photography days I did used to shoot in JPEG and at the time I didn't really know any better but now if I want to go back and sort of edit any old images in my new style you just don't have that creative freedom to to sort of tweak it as much as you like because JPEG is such a compressed file format yeah uh, so I, I would definitely say uh, get used to shooting raw and um, the benefits definitely outweigh the fact that it's a little bit of a pain in the backside and if you're on the fence like Nick said you can always shoot both at once yeah yeah I mean, do, do you find it a benefit kind of do you ever shoot raw and JPEG Rachel yourself or are you just like Emily and just always raw um I always shoot raw um <laughs> because I like the safety net of RAW, actually. <laughs> I, I know JPEG is a bit more for beginners, but actually, if you mess up with a JPEG, you're pretty much screwed. But yeah. with a RAW, you can claw back so much. It kind of um, it's good if you make a mistake. So yeah. <laughs> I like RAW actually. <laughs> it's, it is a really good point, in fairness, that I always see it as it's just it's just a file type. You know, it, it's not going to change. The photo, if you're plugging in all the same settings, etc. I mean, you will get maybe a slightly different variant on the file, but as you say, it'll be better in RAW. And then all you need is to have maybe some specific type of editing software to be able to edit it and tweak it. But then you can still extract a JPEG from it as well. So if you still like the idea of JPEGs, it's good to have. But yeah, it's just something I've seen a lot of people say that they, they, they're they worried or they're scared about RAW. I, I, I don't know what what is that worry that they have? I don't know if anyone's ever kind of understood that. that I say I an irrational this. fear. Go on, go on. I've got a great example of this. My dad is a landscape photographer and for whatever reason, he will not shoot in RAW. And it does my head in because he has so many lovely, lovely images. But as Rachel was saying, you know, if the sky is slightly clipped or if you want to pull out some shadow detail, he just doesn't have that flexibility shooting in JPEG. And I think it is down to just, he assumes that it'll need a crazy piece of software to do it when in fact yeah. it's it's just like editing a jpeg except you've got more wiggle room that is so <laughs> so true i mean it, I've, I've started to see online now that 
Um, I can't think of any of the names off the top of my head. Maybe else, maybe somebody else could uh, throw a name in if they know one. But um, some online editing software that's totally free and that will accept raw files. You can upload raw files and edit them and tweak them online. They don't have to be JPEG. So it's literally like you don't even have to pay now to to get the software. You don't have to have Photoshop, which always seemed to be, you know, it, the, the stalwart of, of editing raw pictures. But I don't know if anyone's ever used like online photo editors, but I, I believe there is maybe one or two that at least can help you edit RAWs in some capacity. So it feels like there's no excuse in one way to, to edit with RAW or to shoot with RAW at least anyway, is there? Mm. I think I, a long time ago, I used one which was called Phoenix. I don't know if it's still available. Um, that was an online one. Um, and if you particularly don't want to get into too much editing, those online ones are quite good because they, they keep them quite simple because obviously they're free. So yeah. they are a good option. They're not as overwhelming as uh, Photoshop or Lightroom. Yeah. Would you recommend to, for someone to shoot in RAW or RAW and JPEG when they're first kind of starting out? Um, I normally say to people, as soon as they want to try any editing, then that's the time to start shooting on RAW. Yeah. If, they, if they're still very scared or they don't, maybe they don't even have a computer um then i just say just stay on jpeg but as soon as you want to start editing your images then go on to raw into raw good start I think a lot of people when they first start off they're so used to um, everything being in jpeg format aren't they so they're, they're, mm. they're not really aware of it until you get into photography more seriously digital work um so for a lot of people they're so used to seeing jpegs they just think automatically oh that's what that's what a photo is it's a jpeg an image is a jpeg which it yeah. isn't i mean an image could be all sorts of different formats can't it but okay. jpeg has just become so common and i mean i always think of it i, I mean that's one of the big advantages with digital is that you can shoot in raw format because you you can get more information. Whereas when you used to shoot on film, you were limited to what, what the film would cope with, say in terms of exposure. So, you know, you couldn't get all that information in one image. And uh, th there was, I remember there was a particular way of processing that I used to use where you could get you, some, I can't remember how you did it, but you used to be able to squeeze more um, sort of uh, information onto a piece of film by processing it in a more dilute solu solution for longer. Uh, and that's what I used to do to try and get as much in the shadows and in the highlights. But the thing is, with shooting in raw, you, you know, you've potentially you've got it all there without having to worry about that. So, you know, it's, it's a, it's a really big advantage of digital work and it, you know it seems silly not to not to take advantage of it really yeah i think i think you're right there's a lot more latitude um that it gives people with digital yeah. photography these days definitely um so there we go okay so some good advice i think already starting off um the the other point that the, well one of the other points that i had um now again i'm hopefully i'm sure all four of you uh i'm sorry all four of us uh kind of do this but about not making two backups. This is something I'm so kind of pedantic about and religious about almost is making sure that I've got two versions of every image that I ever take just for absolute fail safe. But how, how many times do you guys back up a photograph just out of interest? I think mine generally get backed up on the cloud mm -hmm. and I've got, you know, I back stuff up on hard drive as well. And then I've, you know, I've got stuff on the laptop, I suppose. So the, does that count as three? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that counts as three, doesn't it? Um, what I would say, though, is don't, like you say, back up everything you take. I just, like, there's just no room to back up everything that, that you take. It, go through the images and work out, you know, which ones you need and back those up. Otherwise, you just get, I, I mean, I'm guilty of just sometimes just randomly i just say oh i need to back up everything that's on my camera back it all up i mean to go back and go through it and then get rid of all the stuff that i don't actually want and i never i never seem to do it and you just end up with way too much and it was the same when i used to take i used to keep all my negatives and you kind of think at some point you need to instead of having boxes and boxes of them you need to sort of edit them out as well yeah so Anybody it's getting else? a you know a compromise between the two, backing up everything you, that you want to back up, but not just backing up everything for the sake of it. I am yeah. an absolute hoarder. I have so <laughs> many hard drives. I, I always I have an argument with you. <laughs> I always intend to do exactly what Nick has said. And no, you Never could happens. go back and find a photograph that I've accidentally took of my own feet ten years ago. 
in raw because I'm terrible for in it. raw as well in raw um, <laughs> one thing to add to um, the discussion of of backing up as well is is if, if budget allows or if, if you are working towards maybe getting paid work looking at cameras that have dual SD slots is mm-hmm. is worth its weight in gold because then for every image you take you've got two backups straight away before you've done anything else and I'm all for contingencies definitely uh, and in terms of backing up at home I just have hard drives for days and cloud storage as well but I am a bit of a hoarder so maybe don't do it to my extremes <laughs> <laughs> how about you Rachel um well actually when I started um doing photography for work and I was working in a studio um they actually lost a memory card of all the bride's preparation shots um and that was really really bad but that was back in the day where they didn't have two two memory card slots it was just the one they actually lost the actual physical card so um i'd say if you can have two cards especially if it's something like a wedding where you just cannot repeat it then it's it's obviously really worth it um for myself when i go out to africa i'm not planning on going there again for that particular shot so um I, i'm a bit like emily when when i'm out there as soon as i get back in the tent then i'll, I'll back it up onto the laptop and external hard drive and i'll leave it on my memory cards as well um memory's become so cheap now that i just think it's worth just buying more memory <laughs> I prefer it, to do you're, that. So, you're so right i i had um um, a guy I used to work with in the studio and he was he was a little bit older than me he, he, he kind of always he kind of more came from like a film generation um, and he was always the same because he'd always kept negatives like Nick had said um, that when he transferred to digital he never deleted his images off his memory cards and he's treated his memory cards as uh, like a, a digital negative so he kept them all on there and he literally had stacks in the way that you would have stacks of negatives he had absolute boxes full of memory cards, as you say, because it's so cheap. Um, but it kind of pre- you know preserves them in that kind of little format. There, it was it was nice to see, but yeah, I say the amount of money that you must go through. Uh, oh yeah, I'm not that extreme. <laughs> I'm not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm bad yeah, absolutely. especially if you get the high speed cards. So. Well, exactly. Oh, yeah, if you're shooting like, vi- video or pound of pop. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and as, as Rachel will need the high speed cards for all the burst mode for all the wildlife, yeah, and I do yeah. for for weddings and things. Um, top tip, which I do every year without fail, is wait for Black Friday and then buy yeah. your SD cards in bulk. They literally go half price. It's great. Yeah, yeah. Mm. very good. Very good point. And yeah, so I think that's really um, quite important, especially because given your uh, points of view, uh, Emily and Rachel, that with you owning your own businesses and running your businesses like that, having backups is is just crucial. It's not a case of, you know, say uh, if I was taking a picture, it was just for fun, you know, I lost it all right it happens but for you guys it could impact you commercially um which is a, is a big thing to consider as well so i think yeah seeing it on two different levels is really important but very very good point i think about the dual card slots as well that's a great thing it is quite different though because uh when i was working commercially uh people i didn't get to keep my negatives because the client got the negatives so I didn't get to keep them. So most of the commercial work that I did, I, I don't have. Whereas nowadays, obviously, you can keep everything you've got. Yeah. So you have like, so, it, you know, in terms of what I've got from back then, very, very little in terms of what I did commercially because it always went to the client. It's so. almost the exact reverse now, isn't it? Where we keep yeah. the high high resolution yeah. raw files and we'd give them. Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. That's, uh... It is, is. you know, when you start figuring it out, yeah, it shows how the world's changed. But um, the next point on my list that I've I've written down was entitled Not Shooting With A Purpose. And I think this is my kind of little bugbear that I probably still do it now, every now and again. And I think everyone's kind of, you know, kind of committed this crime, let's say. But basically going out and taking a picture, but not really knowing what you want in it, what you want it to be. It's just, you've taken it because it looks pretty and not necessarily it's the best version of that scene possible. But um, I see it, you really see it every now and again, kind of um, in galleries and online, et cetera, as well. But would you say it's something that is more attributed to kind of new photographers or it just happens across the board, whether you're professional or brand new? It's a tricky one because I get you know if you if you're working professionally, obviously you 
you know when you're doing a job you've got a purpose so you're going out there with that particular purpose to you know for the shoot whatever it is if you're photographing you know stuff is it's obviously very different because if you're say a hobby photographer i mean sometimes people just want to go out with a camera and see what happens don't they so i don't think there's anything wrong with that to a certain extent but i think at the same time it's important to you know be aware if you're serious about it developing your own sort of style really i guess you could call it so whether it's different subjects it shooting with a similar kind of approach or it could be that you, you just focus on one particular subject that interests you uh you, you might want to go out you, you might be interested in architectural buildings so you go out and photograph buildings and you develop your style around that so you know purpose wise i'd say that that would be a purpose you know i mean i went out the, the, not with the camera but with the um phone today i just thought i'll have a wander around town because i was just needed to get out uh and and then just started taking photographs of looking up and just taking photographs of buildings because I thought, oh, this, you know, just something to do while I was doing it. And it was quite nice to just sort of do something. So go for a walk with a purpose and, but not too serious, if you see what I mean. Yeah. 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 I think um, for me, I think it is nice to sometimes just go out and see what happens. Um, I mean, that happens an awful lot on safari. You just jump in the car and, you never know what you're going to see <laughs> nine times out of ten the thing you really want to see is not what you're going to see so <laughs> it's just it's but I think it's more that when you do actually find something it's taking your time to then think about it and then compose it and yeah. whatever it is that you're taking the picture of that you found that tickles your fancy you still need to really think about it and I think that's where beginners maybe don't quite understand that yet they'll just pick up their camera and point and shoot without really taking the time to think about the process so yeah. maybe it's more that than not shooting with a purpose yeah for me yeah. I think I agree I, I think when you get a, a new piece of gear I bet you've all done it I bet you've all done it if you've got a new camera or a new lens <laughs> you'll go in your back garden and you'll find a dandelion or a rusty <laughs> nail or your dog or your cat and I think when you're a beginner almost it's so exciting to be able to capture things that everything you see could potentially be a subject Mm -hmm. And as you become more and more experienced, as Nick has said, you just start, start to narrow down on, on the subjects that appeal to you. But personally, you know, if, I, if I'm traveling, I love nothing more than just wandering around with my camera. I think it's it's really, really um, therapy for me in a way. It's, you know, you can clear your mind and you just go out and you just see what what's there to be seen. And it's a great way to capture your memories. So, yes, purpose is important. We don't want 10,000 shots of uh, dandelions in the gallery but also having just fun is great as well yeah mm. yeah yeah I think I think you both kind of like hit the nail on the head in terms of kind of what I was trying to get across is that once you've got that moment in front of you it's not just including you know the sun the sky absolutely everything that's in front of you it's seeing what really is attracting you to that moment really as well because yeah you you've got to enjoy it you're, you're totally right but Along that line, continuing along the line of actual shooting, I've written down here, always shooting at eye level. Now, I know I've seen that for a fact across the whole of the internet. People just stand there with their camera at eye level and shoot whatever's in front of them. And there is, there's no kind of consciousness about angles. Now, that may be a case that people aren't aware, you know, they don't understand composition, et cetera. But I think that's something that could be really beneficial to a new photographer to learn about angles really um otherwise all your photographs look like they've just come from the exact same point of view but does it, has anybody else kind of seen that would anyone argue against that point or or kind of uh, think it's a fair estimate to say i think maybe sometimes people are a bit um self-conscious when they're out hmm. so the idea of like, like sort of lying on your back on, on the ground <laughs> somewhere and shooting upwards or climbing on top of something to get a different kind of angle or viewpoint, it, it, it's a little bit, you know, it's a little, you know, it's confidence, I think, mm. that allows you to do that. And it's like, it's one of those things that I, I remember when I first photographed sort of um, performers and things like that, you'd be very conscious of the fact that everybody else is watching a performance and you're standing there with a camera. And, you know, the first times I did it, I tended to just stay out of the way, stay at the edge, standing up, just take take some photos that way. 
but after a while you realize you have to get in and do something a bit more different so then i'd be sort of throwing myself the floor in front of the stage and shooting upwards and stuff like that because <laughs> you're just going to get more interesting shots that way yeah. but you've got to have the confidence to do it so yeah. i think partly that's why people tend to just think oh, we'll just walk around with the camera we don't want to we don't want to draw attention to ourselves so i think it's partly that yeah i'd, I'd agree with that i think it is a, a lot of confidence i've, I've teach a lot of very new beginners and I don't think they quite understand at that point how just moving slightly to the left or slightly to the right up or down can completely change the image and yeah. um, so I think it is a bit of you've just got to, like you say have the confidence to experiment and yeah. um, and I think just remember that it, it's hard isn't it because we see the world from whatever height we're at but whatever we're photographing sees it at a different height and it's that what we want to capture we want to see what that thing sees if yeah. it's got eyes <laughs> or, <laughs> or the perspective from a different angle we're not yeah. it's not always about what we're trying to see but trying to tell the story of the thing we're photographing so I think it's trying to get in that mindset as well which for a beginner is quite hard they've got all the technical things to remember as well <laughs> yeah I remember really early on when I was learning photography, I did like a, a 52 week challenge where, you know, it was take a picture of a red thing or weather or whatever. And, and the weeks that I learned the most from were look up, look down, the ones that physically all week I had to change my perspective and, and architecture lends itself to sort of looking up. Uh, you know, there's so many different avenues to, to see when you do change your perspective. But as, as everyone said, you know, you've got a lot to think about when you're a new photographer. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it doesn't come straight away, but definitely experiment with your angles for sure. Also I, I, try not to get run over. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like there's a story behind that, Nick. You're going to have to elaborate. Well, on <laughs> I'm very bad at, um, I, you know, because I, I get a little bit obsessed with whatever it is. So, talking about architecture photographing a building and you forget you know that there's cars and traffic and people on bikes and things like that and I've quite often just walked out into the middle of the road and say oh shit I'm in the middle of the road I mustn't do that and um, or dodge out of the way of a bike or something like that and or even sort of you know fall off things because mm. you just you know once you you're looking through a camera and you don't you don't see anything else I find you get yeah. so involved in that you just forget that you're actually out somewhere and that there's other things going on around you yeah so yeah. be careful I've I, I've done that and I've started to learn uh, to shoot with both eyes open does anyone else do that fried but I find it really confusing <laughs> it is hard me. I, 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 yeah. I, I, use, I use the 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 screen less than the viewfinder myself because it does give you a little bit more flexibility yeah i only used to do it because in the studio we, we I, I come from portraits we had kids running around left right and center so i'm focusing upon one but i had to know what the others were doing to see the other opportunities so i'm a, literally i had to keep two eyes open to dodge in between looking through the viewfinder and then also kind of just keeping my eyes open to the side just to get my you know my spatial awareness as you say making sure i don't stand on anybody or stand on anybody or stand on a dog or something like that but then also <laughs> see the other opportunities but yeah you, you're totally right i think you've, you've got to be you know spatially aware of what's going on around you as well <laughs> um next point i had written down i just entitled again trigger happy shooters can you take too many photographs is it a bad thing to take too many um and then end up with hundreds potentially thousands of images uh, after a shoot or is that just you know part of the course of being a beginner would you say i think it really depends what you're taking a photo of i mean if if you're gonna stand in exactly the same place and point the camera and then take 50 and you're not moved anywhere and mm. the light's not changed or it's just 50 of the same shot i think that's you're not going to really learn anything from that um yeah. whereas on the other side of the scale if, if you're doing like a, a sport event or uh, something that's moving 50 shots could give you so much opportunity for the different uh, movements in the shot so i think it depends again a bit about your purpose and what you're taking your picture of and why you're taking so many shots are you trying to capture that decisive moment or are you just not really thinking about it at all <laughs> if, if it's like a static object though i think i think that's kind of what my um 
where where I was coming from, I suppose, is that, yeah, if you just literally stood in front of something like the Eiffel Tower or whatever, would you try to kind of limit yourselves consciously to think, I'm just going to maybe take one or two shots or and then I'm going to move on angles? How, how do you guys approach, you know, any kind of still life or, or, or architecture work, etc.? I think I'd try to sort of have in my mind what I want in the shot. So you, you're kind of obviously composing it in camera. I tend to work like that. I tend to look at it in terms of how I'm composing it in camera, sort of whether it's on the monitor or, or through through the viewfinder. Um, obviously, I, you know, I'll edit and crop things afterwards if necessary. Uh, and that kind of, and then, you know, sort of limit myself in terms of, right, I've got that shot, so now I'll move and try a different shot. You know, I could get an angle like this or an angle like that. So, and I, I definitely would say don't take too many. And it's obviously very different if, you, if you're photographing wildlife and, you you know, you could take a whole load of shots really quickly and just get one shot out of it that's going to work. Whereas I think, if like you say, if you're photographing a building or a still life, it's much more about um, composing the image and being satisfied and thinking, you know, thinking about what you want and just going for that. And once you've got it, move on and get, you know, go on to the next shot. Yeah. I think um, as a wedding photographer, shooting with intent is, is really important throughout the day. So, for instance, if it's bridal prep, I might take a few photographs because if I was in there paparazziing them, they're going to panic. Whereas if it's uh, people walking down the aisle, I'm going to take loads. If it's someone having a speech, it might just take one or two shots and then you know you've got it because they know they've not moved. So I think as, as Rachel said, it's, it's whatever your subject is sort of dictates it. Uh, but generally speaking, as long as you've got a plan and an intent for each composition, we, we are shooting digital. So it's cheap enough to go wild if you want. But then are you going to sit down and edit 250 photographs of essentially the same thing? Hmm. <laughs> yeah, don't give yourself so much work. I mean, I do think it, it can potentially be confusing. And, and often when you've got too many of similar shots to choose from, it's really hard to choose which one you think is mm. best. Yeah. And then you, you end up not liking any of them. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? Like, I think yeah, we see that in the blind. gallery, don't we? We see that in the gallery, yeah. don't we? Sometimes people, they just don't know which one to upload, so they upload five or six and... There's hardly any variance between them. It's, it is really hard to choose. Yeah. And I think if you limit yourself, you're more likely to sort of be satisfied with the shot that you've got because you don't have a choice of half a dozen other ones that are just almost, you know, ooh, that one's, well, this one's got this, that one's got that. If, if you know, if you limit yourself more, then, you, then you're just you're going to be satisfied with what you've got because you don't have any other options. And as a viewer as well, I would be more blown away by one shot from, from, a, from an event than if I was sifting through 10. Almost as a photographer, you have to kind of, choose for your audience which one is the best one mm. yeah yeah cool and uh, so yeah let's kind of pick up kind of on our next point uh which was about missing focus now this is something i see a fair amount every now and again in our gallery and eye photography about people kind of maybe putting the focus slightly maybe in the wrong position or using the wrong uh focus setting or focus mode um every now and again but I mean I, I I probably do it even now you know I just kind of get my you know my bearings ever so slightly wrong as well but are, are you guys are you quite uh, specific about what focus modes that you use on certain subjects or do you leave it kind of on a, a generic setting and just kind of go with it I think I just um I've noticed when I've taught beginners that a lot of people don't actually realize that you can move it a lot of people think it's stuck in the middle and they have to then move their camera or you know wherever it will land on the middle is where they think it needs to be um so just actually being able to move it up down left and right I think is really quite liberating for a lot of people <laughs> <laughs> it is it was for me <laughs> when, when I first got a digital camera because Again, it's the difference between digital and uh, old uh, uh, SLRs is that, you know, if you, well, A, mostly they didn't have autofocus anyway, so yeah, you were always focusing. And then it was the other, if you did have any kind of autofocus, you could, it would only focus on one point and then you have to focus it on, on what you wanted and then stop it from, and, and then fix that focus point and then move the camera to, to, 
to create the image. Uh, and now you don't have to do that. As, as you say, you can move that point to wherever you want. Um, I find, because I've got terrible eyesight, uh, I always have issues with focusing anyway, because um, I just... <sighs> So I tend to, you know, obviously it depends on what the situation, but if you can, I always tend to actually go onto my monitor after I've taken the shot and blow it up, go in close and make sure that I focused where I want to and check the focus as well afterwards. I'm, um, I'm a little bit of a control freak when it comes to my focus. I do just use like the single spot autofocus and having a touch screen on your camera is so good because you can literally just move it around and it's really intuitive. I really don't have much much sort of interest in these gimmicky focus modes where it's, you know, like eye detect or animal mm -hmm. detect or, you know. Oh, I love it. <laughs> it, it, it Brilliant. I, I just, it, are they good in, in, in your cameras? Maybe I've just got the wrong cameras. <laughs> to, be, to be honest, um, I don't think they work very well in a lot of cameras. Um, that there, there was like a dynamic thing on the old Nikon I had and it, it was it didn't really work but the new Sony cameras the animal AI is is pretty incredible okay. um, but yeah I think you're right on a lot of cameras they are gimmicks and it's better Certainly. to learn the field craft anyway and on know my, how to do it properly <laughs> on my beloved Lumix you'll get like motion tracking and it'll just have a handy dandy box over the subject but not actually focus on the subject it's like yeah you found it well done now could you focus on it so it, it depend brand specific it really does depend on how good these automated modes are but as you say learning it yourself and having a little bit more creative control as well i just use like a single spot autofocus and wiggle it around yeah yeah very good point that's the eye photography podcast not sponsored by sony just in case anybody was uh... <laughs> not sponsored by Lumix. <laughs> yes, it's certainly not sponsored by Lumix after that comment. They'll never come here ever again. <laughs> Sony, on the other hand, though, <laughs> may have found our new best friend. I'm with you on that one, though, Rachel, definitely. Um, okay, one of the other, the kind of latter little points um, is, is handheld camera shake. Um, I've seen this really recently. I was actually responding to a, a member in iPhotography today uh, who'd been taking some shots and they, they looked a little bit um, shaky in some areas. And it's because he was shooting at one fifteenth of a second uh, handheld. So, yeah, even I thought, you know, even at the steadiest hands, um, you know, a, a, a brain surgeon probably couldn't keep his hands steady at that kind of rate, really, as well. But that's one thing I see. But is there a particular kind of level that you wouldn't drop beneath in terms of shot speed shooting handheld? It'd be interesting to know if you, if you all differ. Emily's got a finger up. In, here, in, I've got my finger of... <laughs> I don't know why. The benefit um, of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> my camera has this wonderful thing, and I don't know if it is a Lumix thing or an anything else thing, but in aperture priority mode, you can set your minimum shutter speed which I set to 1 one twenty fifth, which generally unless you've got a longer lens is a really good starting point but what I do for um, to make sure I've got everything crisp and, and in focus is particularly in England when it's cloudy don't be afraid of using shutter speed priority because your camera is going to want to let light in it's probably going to have a wide aperture anyway and then you've got absolute control over making sure that things don't shake Sometimes in, in cloudier conditions or indoors, aperture priority will just put your shutter speed really, really low. Um, so yeah, a safety mode, in my opinion, is an underrated mode is, is shutter speed priority mode. I am a fan. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Maybe so. no, I think that's a really good idea. It is a good idea. Um, in terms of... Um handheld shooting or say you, you're not always going to want to lug a tripod around with you are you i mean it's good if you've always got one with you it's great to use a tripod whenever you can but also it's time to kind of think out of the box a bit and how to keep your camera steady if you don't have a tripod i know some people you know suggest carrying a little like beanbag thing around with you so you can actually find something like even it could be a fence post and you stick your beanbag on top of it and nestle the camera down into it other ways of keeping your camera steady the um the sort of human tripod idea where you've put your elbows down on something and hold your camera and make a make a triangle press it against you that's another way of doing it i mean it, it's not perfect but it can help so there are ways of doing it yourself and also um just uh you can get camera shake even on a tripod when you press the shutter that's the other thing i think people forget so you know if if you are using a low shutter speed um i don't know did the cameras come with 
cable releases these days. I mean, yes, mine doesn't have. Got, yeah, they've got self timers as well. <laughs> yeah. I'm just self waiting timer. for like two timer. seconds. I was yeah. going to say, yeah. I was used to use a cable release, obviously, with a, with a manual camera. Uh, and But if you don't have a cable release yet, use the timer, which is the way I do it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that they're probably two good alternatives. They may not be. One may not be ideal for, say, like action photography or, or wildlife, as Rachel will probably say, with self timers because your moments got to happen. So your shut release is better. But yeah, I think you're totally right, really, is to, is to you know, maybe invest in one of those because the micro vibration of just pressing the, the shutter itself can just cause that little bit of disruption. Um, so I think a lot of landscape photographers do that, especially for long exposure. Um, they'll they'll mm. kind of press it and it may give them a two or five second head start and then they can literally just stand back out of the way and just not cause any any drama to it really but um, the other thing is even the, just the mirror flicking up and down in old cameras used to vibrate as well so mm. it was like lock it lock, you know, had, had the mirror lock and lock the mirror up so mm. once you've set everything up lock the mirror up I used to have to do that a lot with my um, medium format camera because the mirror was so big and they make the whole thing shake when it's at the photo <laughs> I have to say as well, with, with newer cameras, like the in-body stabilization is uh, amazing. Like I, I doing light trails of an evening, if I haven't got a tripod with me, I could easily hand hold, uh, hand hold, would that be the right way to say it? I could take a shot at like half a second and it would be fine. Um, but that is using the right camera and lens combination. Yeah. You have to go quite high up in most ranges to get that kind of performance. Mm. And even then, if your subjects move in, you can have as much ibis as you want, but you need the faster shutter speed to, to freeze the motion in place. Yeah. And just yeah. adversely on um, talking about faster things, if you're starting to use telephoto lenses, then try and stick to the rule of whatever your focal length is of that lens. That should really be your minimum shutter speed. So if you've got a, a lens which is 400 mil, then your shutter speed should really be at, at least 400 mil without without a tripod so for anyone using those bigger heavier lenses that's a good starting point as well indeed very 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 good point yeah the, the reciprocal rule i believe it's called but does that you take that into co uh, consideration with um crop factors as well yeah you have to so, double it so if, if you yeah, have a micro four yeah. thirds camera double um the shutter speed that from the focal length so if you yeah, had a 25 yeah. mil lens you would have a 50th minimum shutter speed yeah. And that's really important. I think a lot of um, beginners don't know that. Um, they, they understand the crop and they understand the magnification, but they don't necessarily understand it also does affect your shutter speeds. Awesome. There we go. Some great tips to end on as well. So hopefully if you're listening to this podcast, if you're watching this as a video uh, on YouTube as well, you picked up some really, really helpful uh, insights as to kind of maybe little pitfalls and accidents that you can kind of watch out for as new photographers or aspiring photographers. But if there's anything else that you're, you know, as a listener that you're picking up on yourself and you're finding maybe mistakes that you've made a couple of times over or you've seen other people make, um, then get in touch. Let us know. We'd love to kind of maybe elaborate on this and we can maybe do a part two and a, and a follow up because I'm sure there's probably tons more that we can talk about in terms of little perils and pitfalls to watch out for. But um, in the two simple things. Oh, can I just it. add two simple things that, Indeed, that go I was it. gonna? Uh, the really, really obvious simple things: uh, horizons. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. And edge of your frame. That there's not some stupid thing poking in, you know, like that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I mean, if this is a podcast, you won't have been able to see what I just said, what I just did. But yeah, you have things to catch poking. The YouTube version. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So check check the edges uh, of your shot as well to make sure that you don't have. Just you know, look at what you're taking a photo. Don't just focus on what you're taking the photograph of. Look at the stuff around it, stuff in the background, stuff around the edge of the frame. Make sure you, you've only got what you want in the shot Brilliant. yeah yeah you're so true i think things like horizons they, they probably deserve their own podcast the amount of uh, <laughs> times i see the odd little kind of wonky part here or there as well and it's so easy to get rid of but with that said we have got tons more i photography podcasts a to come and ones that we've already done so if you've uh, if this is the first episode that you've listened to thank you so much for sticking with us uh, so hopefully you found this really really insightful and entertaining at the same time we always like to provide both services uh, but you can check out all the other episodes that we've got you can find i photography on all major social media if you want to know a little bit more about iPhotography in general head to iPhotography.com um, 
we've got tons of information on there about different courses that you can join as well and even our membership platform that would give you access to all our fantastic tutors that you hear um, and be able to give you kind of uh, regular feedback and focusing on our photo critiques etc 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 so i won't try to oversell it too much but i just want to say thank you very much for emily nick and rachel for joining us uh, in this podcast and uh, again hopefully if you've enjoyed it you'll catch us up for more so from me i just want to say goodbye you guys can say goodbye as well. Nah, goodbye! <laughs> <laughs> what a lovely ending. Yeah. Well done. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. We'll catch you on the next episode. <laughs>